Our scripture reading for this morning, the Sunday after the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, comes to us from Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It can be found in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 118. Hear now God's word to us. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood before them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God bless to us the reading of God's holy word. Amen. It's okay, Cooper. I won't make it terribly long, I promise. It's about time is that idiomatic expression that has a certain tone of impatience. Like saying, so you finally got here. Or, it's about time you paid me what you owed me. So with that kind of tone of impatience, I'm going to state some information that I know to be true, and then you're going to respond by saying, it's about time. All right? You got that? All right, Here's, let's try this first one. The La Milagro Center is scheduled to open later this month. It's about time. Okay, you got it. Good, good. All right, all right. The new sanctuary doors were finally installed this past Thursday. It's about time. My mechanic finally figured out why my MG had been stalling intermittently. It's about time. Yes, it is. Road work that began in 2020, on, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2011, on Interstate 80 from the Sacramento Yellow County line to Watt Avenue, is, I believe, scheduled to reopen late summer, fall, maybe? It's <laughs> the disciples are poised to start their mission after 40 days of preparation and instruction from their risen Lord. It's about time. The power of God's Holy Spirit, God's holy breath, is ready to be poured out at Pentecost upon the early church. It's about time. Our text today, and thank you for that. You guys do that really well. Our text today is one of those that is seldom preached on, and that I have actually only preached on it once before. So it's about time that I preach on it again. It is, of course, the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven, a story of transition and change for the followers of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, Ascension Day was actually last Thursday, May 5, the 40th day after Easter, and 10 days before Pentecost. Penta means 50, so 50 days. 
which according to Acts is the length of time the disciples waited for the gift of God's Holy Spirit. The ascension of Christ is seen as the final act in God's drama of redemption, marking the completion of Jesus' earthly ministry. It is the transition between Jesus' story and the church's story. Now, there are several things of note in this story that should be called to our attention, like who is this Theophilus person? Theophilus is mentioned only here in Acts and also in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3. Scholars believe that Theophilus is the individual to whom the author of Luke and Acts addresses and dedicates both volumes of his work. His name means lover of God, which is interesting because it is believed that he was a ranking Roman official who became a Christian convert, as implied in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, so that you, Theophilus, may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Also mentioned only here is the phrase, many convincing proofs. This phrase refers to the fact that real people have actually seen Jesus and that he is really alive. He's resurrected. He eats with them, we are told. He shows them the marks on his hands, his feet, his side. He interprets scripture to them and commissions them for ministry. The reference to 40 days symbolizes an extended period of preparation and examination for the difficult work ahead. It also reminds us of Noah and the ark and the 40 days and nights of rain. It reminds God's people of the 40-year wilderness wanderings and the time when Moses and Elijah went into the wilderness for 40 days to discover the will of God. And then, of course, how Jesus was led into the wilderness and tested by the devil for 40 days and nights. All of these references to extended periods of preparation now culminate with Jesus spending 40 days in Jerusalem with his disciples, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. But all this talk about the kingdom of God has them yearning for the good old days and asking Jesus, is this finally the time? The disciples want to know more. They want to know if this is the time when God will restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, did you notice that shift from Jesus talking about the kingdom of God to the disciples wanting to know when God will restore the kingdom to Israel? The disciples still don't quite get it. They are dealing with their own preconceived notions. They still yearn for the political reconstitution of David's Israel. They still yearn for a Messiah like David, even after all they have gone through with Jesus, his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. This, of course, begs the question for all of us, what kingdom are we hoping for when we hear all this talk about the kingdom of God? Are we hoping for a kingdom of survival, asking Jesus to please fill our pews with young families so we know we will simply survive into the future? Or maybe we're hoping for a kingdom of busyness and activity. If only we could do more, feed more hungry people, help more people, do more for those in need. That is the kingdom we are hoping for. Or maybe we're hoping for a kingdom of consumption, a kingdom where we provide more programs, more entertaining worship services, to be a church that is bigger and better, appealing to more and more people who are shopping for just the right faith community. And what is Jesus' response to all of this? He, he tells his disciples to be patient. The time will come when God is ready. But in the meantime, in this interim time, 
you are called to be his witnesses. Now, witness is a judicial term, someone who could speak about something based on their personal knowledge or experience. In Israelite tradition, the testimony of two or three witnesses was required to secure a conviction in a court of law. The disciples were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, which was a comfortable and familiar setting for them. And in Judea, the territory that surrounds Jerusalem. And in Samaria, a territory that was somewhat hostile to Jews. And unto the ends of the earth where they would find themselves in totally uncharted territory. The disciples' faithfulness as witnesses may eventually entail martyrdom and persecution, as the word witness in the Greek is actually martis, and will later develop into the word martyr, someone who is killed or suffers greatly for their beliefs. Finally, the Ascension story concludes with the disciples encountering two men in white robes, hearkening back to the transfiguration story where Jesus encounters Moses and Elijah on top of the mountain. Or perhaps this reference recalls the two men in dazzling white clothes who comfort the women at the empty tomb. In either case, this emphasis on two witnesses confirms the Torah's requirement that two witnesses must confirm the veracity of an alleged event. And even though none of the disciples were actually present to witness Jesus' resurrection, they are now present for his ascension, lending credibility to their proclamation that Jesus is alive and the tomb is empty. The ascension of Jesus. It ushers in a new era and a new time for Christ's followers. This story is actually less about what is happening to Jesus and more about what is happening to the lives of those earliest Christians. The ascension story is this brief interim time between promise and fulfillment, where the followers of Jesus are called to live faithful and obedient lives, bearing witness to the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. Richard M. Landers comments on this text saying, when Jesus is taken out of their sight, the disciples are left gazing up toward heaven. The posture of expectation represents their belief in the immediate return of their Lord. Two messengers ask them, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Implying the need to move ahead in the practice of ministry. The two messengers do not comfort or counsel by dwelling on the apostles' loss, but rather urge them ahead to active engagement in a new era. This story is a call to action, a call to ministry, a call to love. And even though the disciples are told to wait for the promised power of the Holy Spirit, it is to be an active waiting. Waiting that includes testimony and witness and the retelling of the resurrection story. As a result of that witness, and as a result of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, those disciples will soon be accused of, later in the book of Acts, of turning the world upside down. No more gazing toward heaven and waiting for Jesus to fix things at the end of time. We're called to active engagement in this time, in this new era, in this changing culture, in this changing church. One thing I know about CPC is that we are a church of action, of doing, of caring, of loving one another. But are we a church of witness? We are a very busy place every single day. 
people coming and going, people being fed and housed, providing showers for the homeless, a place of mission and outreach. But are we a church of witness? And I also know that we do all of these things because of our deep and abiding faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But are we a church of witness? I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes. But I also think that as Presbyterians, we say yes with our actions more than we do with our words. Maybe it's time to balance things out to a certain degree and also bear witness in the retelling of the resurrection story and the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's about time that we live into the fullness of Jesus' call to be his witnesses. What do you think? Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, gracious and wondrous God, thank you for your holy presence with the disciples for those 40 days, that period of preparation and instruction before the coming of your promised Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, O Lord, and the call to service and proclamation and of witness. Thank you for the active mission of this congregation who gives so much of their time and energy and talents to the meeting of needs in the name of Jesus Christ. May you continue to bless our witness in all of its forms. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.